Chapter 26, Anthem, Arizona, October 23rd, 2016. Lucy Jastro was riding her bicycle to the community center to meet her friend Gertrude and have Sunday brunch. There were things she didn't like about living in Anthem, but this was one of the perks. It was flat and relatively safe in that there weren't many cars to contend with. You could leave your house and pick one of three or four routes, depending how much exercise you were up for. Of course, to Lucy, the tracked houses all looked the same, so whichever route you chose, it became confusing sometimes to navigate back in the end and find your own house. This was one of the negatives, she supposed, how plastic it was here. Not much character, on the surface no real individuality, everything planned and organized and squeaky clean right down to the manicuring of the fake grass putting green. Lucy had moved here two years ago, from New Braunfels, Texas. Her son, Matt, convinced her. He lived in Phoenix, 45 minutes south of Anthem, which put the grandkids close, and that was a perk. The other part, she knew, was Matt, plus her daughter, Faye, who lived in New Jersey, didn't completely trust her anymore, being so isolated out there in the Texas Hill Country. Adding to why they were concerned about her, Lucy was convinced, was her fascination with UFOs. It made them uneasy. She hadn't dwelled much on the subject for decades, though the childhood incident with her dad was in her head on some level every day. Then, six years ago, when Craig left her for another woman named Stella, who was in fact at one time her best friend, Lucy had quite a bit of trouble sleeping and frequently woke up in the middle of the night. She discovered a talk show on AM radio, way down at the end of the dial, where they focused very little on politics and news of the day, and mostly on the strange and offbeat, which included unexplained phenomena in the skies. In fact, Lucy was tempted to call in a few times when something the host or a guest said really hit home. One subject that came up frequently was a claim that a UFO crashed in Roswell in the late 1940s, a couple hundred miles from Hillsdale, where her grandpa lived and where, and where she and her dad had their experience in 1956. A Roswell crash didn't make a lot of sense on the surface. First of all, if they were able to travel between stars or maybe even galaxies, how unlikely would it be for something to happen weather-wise or mechanically when they reached Earth's atmosphere that would cause them to crash land? Except for the way it was handled. First, you had newspaper articles telling the world a flying saucer had hit. Then the next day, the Army issues a statement that no, what crashed was a weather balloon. Fine, newspapers make mistakes. But, if a simple weather balloon fell to Earth, what was the Army doing there, then? Sealing off the crash site. Anyhow, these were the type of questions from the late-night radio program that got Lucy stimulated. So yes, she probably did talk about UFOs to whoever would listen. After all, she didn't have that much going on otherwise. But Matt and Faye didn't like this. They called it an obsession. And Lucy suspected they feared she was turning paranoid and irrational. So she gave in, and here she was in Palm Breeze Manor in Anthem, Arizona. Your HOA fees got you three giant pools, golf if you wanted it, plus tennis and pickleball, a rec center with about a thousand exercise machines, 
and classes and outings and planned activities up the wazoo. Lucy didn't partake in much of it. She liked to ride her bike and take walks and observe people without committing to anything. One good thing was she liked the heat. Even the summers didn't particularly bother her. Today was pretty typical fall weather. High of 86, just a few thin wisps of clouds to the west. And dry, that was for sure. She parked her bicycle and headed inside the community center. They had three restaurants, a traditional bacon and eggs griddle, an Asian place that ran the gamut from sushi to Panda Express type Chinese noodles to Vietnamese soup, which was all tasty, though Lucy doubted it was very authentic, and a good seafood restaurant, which is where she was meeting Gertrude today, the Sandpiper, except that when Lucy gave her name to the hostess, they walked her way back to the rear and then into a banquet room where about a million people burst out with happy birthday and little blow horns sounded and there was confetti and then people started singing to her and Lucy found herself thoroughly embarrassed by the whole thing. Well, happy 65th, Mom, Faye said, planting a kiss on her cheek. Lucy's official birthday wasn't until Wednesday, but either way, a simple lunch with Gertrude would have done the trick. But she put on a happy face, tried to circulate around the room greeting everyone, spent as much time as she could with the grandchildren, especially Faye's kids who made the trip from New Jersey. There was a big cake with three layers, and there were some toasts. The whole affair ran about three hours, and Lucy was exhausted when it finally wound down and people said their final goodbyes and trickled out. When it was over, it was just her and Gertrude the way it was supposed to work in the beginning. Gertrude suggested coffee, and there was a kiosk that brewed it fresh, and they took their coffees outside and stretched out in lounge chairs by one of the pools. Gertrude had become a good friend. She was from Wisconsin, had been here only a year, but Lucy felt close enough to her where she almost wanted to tell her her secret, the one she shared with her dad, which, as she thought about it, was 60 years old now. But she didn't. She'd always remained true to their agreement from back then, that early evening in the dusty town with no one around, her dad in his calm voice telling her it was real, but that it wasn't, and that it would always be their secret, no one else's. The main reason she didn't like birthdays was they made her miss her dad. Her mother was cold, her relationship with Lucy had been thin at best, but her dad was her world. When Lucy was nine, her dad robbed a bank in Oklahoma City. He was caught three days later in Arkansas. There had obviously been plenty of stuff behind the scenes in his life that he'd shielded her from. Now he was going away, the federal penitentiary in Terre Haute, Indiana for 12 years. Her dad might have been paroled in nine, but he never made it that far. He died in prison in 1965 from what Lucy always thought was a broken heart. She had one too that she carried around with her that shaped her life. So birthdays were hard. Lucy and Gertrude walked, or Lucy and Gertrude watched the swimmers and families Frolicking around the pool on this late Sunday, they talked a little movies and TV and books, and then it was time to go, and Lucy got her bicycle and pedaled back home. Chapter 27 Pike had never been on a plane, so in that regard, this was exciting, which Pike figured was unusual when you're 18 years old to have never experienced flying but his dad had loved to drive, to be in control, and all their family trips growing up were in the car, including, of course, the one this past June to the southwest. You were pretty cramped in the plane, that was for sure. The second leg, San Diego to Salt Lake City, they switched to a larger one, so not as bad. Pike was surprised the security seemed pretty light, no long lines or major searches like you'd heard about. He got to Salt Lake City on time, 
was impressed how clean the airport was and wondered if the Mormons had something to do with it, though he didn't know much about the religion and decided he shouldn't be assuming anything. What they had him do, Utah State, or specifically Jake Olson, the grad assistant, who was the one he'd been dealing with, was jump on a shuttle bus at the airport and get off in the center of Logan an hour and a half away and then to let them know uh, that he made it. Pike started to feel a bit like he was in the middle of a cattle call, especially when he started talking to the guy across the aisle from him on the bus, and it turned out the guy was going the same place and was also being recruited. Before the bus ride was over, two more dudes spoke up who were in the same situation. The guy across from him was a pretty nice kid, a guy named Tanner Hayes from Dallas. Another quarterback, Pike learned pretty quick. So, whoopee. All the lines Jake Olson had been feeding him on the phone about what a great fit this would be for Pike and how he was the unique, he has the unique skill set they're looking for. Yeah, right. Pike digested it and figured he may as well go with the flow that you're out here, which means you're not in school, so never a bad thing. Except he'd heard Hannah Maker was getting out of the hospital tomorrow, so there were some second thoughts about being out of town when that unfolded. But what could you do? Olson picked them up in a team van and checked them into the dorms. Pike was surprised how they handled it, they booted some of the freshman players out of their dorm rooms for the weekend, had them triple or quadruple up somewhere else, and gave the rooms to the high school recruits. Pike ended up with Hayes, the quarterback, from the bus. Then they went to a team practice. It wasn't in the stadium. It was on a side field, but the layout was impressive, and you had the mountains right there, snow caps. Practice was light with no contact, because this was Thursday and there was a game Saturday. Pike saw there were four quarterbacks in action on the field, and what looked like a couple more of them redshirting, standing nearby, so it would be quite a log jam to get any playing time out here if he did come, and of course, if they did really want him in the end. Then there was a team dinner, which they called training table. Everyone together in a dedicated cafeteria across from the workout facility, which was only open to varsity athletes and off limits to the general student population. After dinner, one of the assistant coaches got up and announced how pleased they were to have the recruits in this weekend for the Wyoming game, and he had them all stand. Pike wasn't surprised by any of it anymore. And there were probably 40 guys total there like him, at least. After dinner, they split up the recruits by offense and defense, plus lumped all the linemen together. And they took them to one of the halls and put them in classrooms. An assistant coach was in charge of Pike's group, and first he gave a lengthy overview of the program, the expectations of student-athletes, how the standard of play was on the rise and the related BS. Then he ran the second part like a real chalk talk session, diagramming all this junk on the board with multiple squirrely lines and arrows that Pike didn't feel like paying attention to. The head coach popped in for five minutes in the middle and gave a rehearsed speech. It dragged on and they didn't get out of there until close to nine. Pike and Hayes went downtown to see what that was all about. It was clearly a mostly Mormon community, a big LDS temple right in the center of things, and only a few bars that they could see. A Thursday night, very few students downtown it seemed, which Hayes said was very different than most most college towns. He told Pike he'd done a recruiting trip to Colorado State, and it was way different, Thursday night being the fun night on campus, and everyone knew it. One of the bars was the diviest of the two or three in town, and they could see a pool table in back, and Hayes asked Pike if he had a fake ID. Pike did have one, though he only risked using it once, last summer when he was up in San Jose with his friend Mac. He weighed everything, 
If he got caught and reported, that might be it for any shot at Utah State. The flip side, he could pass for 21 years old. At least people told him that. The main reason was he had a thick 5 o'clock shadow. He'd shave in the morning, and then by that night, at least a portion of it had filled back in pretty strong. Hayes himself looked older, and who knows, he might even have been 19 going on 20. Maybe he got held back in third grade or whatever. Pike decided to go for it, and they walked right in, with the bouncer just giving them a cursory check and asking how they were doing tonight. Hayes put back a couple beers pretty quick, and it turned out he wasn't a good drinker and was getting into it a bit with two guys using the pool table who were talking, who were taking too long to finish. Nice shot, Hayes said to the two of them. If you're trying to avoid landing it in the pocket, he let out a laugh. Pike didn't have a good feeling about where this was going. He didn't know a darn thing about this Tanner Hayes kid, other than he seemed like a nice enough guy to shoot the breeze with on a bus ride. But someone was going to fight someone here, probably sooner rather than later. The two guys playing pool started answering back. Good-natured, but sticking in the needle, and Hayes would try to top them. Pike noticed he was amping up the Texas good old boy accent as it developed. The two guys finally finished their game, and one of them came over to Hayes, who was sitting on a high stool, and the guy smiled and told him the table was all his, and as he handed him his cue stick, he fired a short left hand that landed flush on Hayes' right eye. Hayes fell off the stool and tried to scramble to his feet. The other guy had moved in now, and the look on his face told you he wasn't planning to hand over his cue stick. He was planning to use it on Hayes. It occurred to Pike in the instant before he made his move that these guys may have been farmers, but they knew their way around in a bar fight. Pike, Pike popped up and intercepted the second guy, wrapping him in a bear hug. He heard some crackling out of the guy's back, and the guy yelled out, and Pike let him go, and he dropped the cue stick and doubled over. Hayes was on the first guy now. He tackled him, and they were rolling around on the floor going at it when the bouncer pulled him off. Another bouncer showed up as well, and they grabbed the two of them, Pike and Hayes, by the throats, and marched them out into the street and told them don't come back. Obviously, the same rules didn't apply to the two local pool table dudes, which was no surprise, though the one guy who Pike bear-hugged probably had other things to worry about. Despite getting clocked, Hayes was kind of giddy and tried to high-five Pike, though he was staggering a little and missed. Buddy, he said, that was some quick thinking in there. By you. Y'all saved my ass. I ain't ashamed to admit it. Pike decided he didn't care for Hayes, but he didn't like looking at his eye, which was ballooning up bad, so he told them they should find some ice. There was a hole-in-the-wall donut shop still open, and they sat down in there while Hayes iced his messed-up face. The idiot was talking nonstop, telling Pike now about all his supposed other fights and giving blow-by-blow descriptions. Pike ordered a coffee and an apple fritter and tried to block him out. Some old guy at the end of the counter was listening out of politeness, so luckily after a little while, Hayes turned his attention to that guy and continued his stories. There was a metal bin by the door with mixed up newspaper sections and Pike picked one up to kill time. The front page was mostly the presidential election coming up. Trump versus Clinton and the ramifications for northern Utah and southeastern Idaho and the local races that were being contested. Then inside, on page two, there was this headline. Adrenaline surge credited for Pocatello woman's abnormal feat in life and death struggle by Lincoln Paul. October 19th, 2016. A Pocatello woman's burst of strength that resulted in the self-defense death of her boyfriend three weeks ago was likely the result of an acute surge of adrenaline 
a physiologist said Tuesday. Dr. Hiram Blankenship, a medical scientist professor at ISU, said the human brain and body often react to dire stress in complex ways scientists are only beginning to understand. Our guess is that in these situations, instincts tied all the way back to primitive man can indeed surface, yielding a perfect storm of moment of surprising strength and focus, he said. Danny Andreessen, 26, of 128 South 5th Street, killed her boyfriend Marcus Roberts, 28, in self-defense on the afternoon of October 4th in the apartment they shared after he confronted her with a loaded firearm, police said. Speaking on condition of anonymity, a sheriff's department forensics investigator told the Bannock County News that Robert's body appeared to have been launched several feet across the living room and ended up wedged into a wall that had been substantially compromised by the impact. Pocatello Police spokesperson Mike Mullins responded only by saying the incident contained a volatile mix of alcohol, a loaded weapon, and a victim fearing for her life. Andreessen is a second-year kindergarten teacher at Oak Grove School in Blackfoot. She could not be reached for comment. Roberts, a 2012 ISU graduate, was a computer coder for ARC Tech Systems in Chubbuck. Pike tried to digest what he just read, and he read it again, slower. Could it be simply what they were claiming? A one-and-done deal, like when you'd hear of a grandma in Kansas who held up the side of a blown-down house so her grandkid could make it out after a hurricane? That was probably it, a surge. And like the expert doc said, the brain is complicated, and the body feeds off the brain. Right? Pike dragged Hayes out of the donut place. The eye was showing assorted, interesting colors now. And they hustled back to the dorm and made it just under the curfew wire, which was midnight. And maybe it was the clean mountain air, but Pike slept the best he had in a while. Chapter 28 On Friday, there was a team breakfast but with the recruits herded together in the side section of the cafeteria, and soon enough the players were up and gone since they had class, though Pike wondered how serious that all was for most of them. Jake Olson told the recruits to bust their trays and sit back down, and then there was more lecturing about football and life. Jake spoke well, he had good enthusiasm, but Pike was bored off his rear end. Hayes was sitting next to him, not saying much at all this morning. The eye didn't look too good. In fact, he looked in pretty bad shape all around, and guys were asking about it. Hayes did the right thing and waved them off, and this time kept his mouth shut. After that, they took them on a campus tour. That part was kind of an eye-opener for Pike. You had all these students most of them looking pretty content, and every part of your life was right there. You were isolated, but then again you weren't. If you were very very interested in studying something, you could dive in for four years without having to worry about too much else. Pike figured that scenario didn't apply to him too well, though, since he didn't have anything at the moment he was real interested in studying, and that the commitment of football, with these guys owning you, would probably screw everything else up anyway. What he couldn't shake loose of, though, despite these various activities today, was that Danny and Dreesen lady. They gave them an afternoon break, and Pike found a bench in the sun in the main quad and looked her up. There was one article from when it happened, and another a few days later, when the local DA announced no charges would be filed, in the death of this deadbeat. 
there was a tiny item from last year about a rookie teacher award with a picture of her being handed a small plaque by an older man in front of a school. Not a bad-looking lady, and more than that, she looked pretty happy there, not like someone who, not that much later, would have to stare down her life in a flash because of some a-hole. Something else Pike noticed in that newspaper photo. She was on the small side, not tiny like a gymnast, but Pike's guess was plenty of people would call her petite. Okay, a massive adrenaline surge. Whatever. No phone number listed. She was in places like LinkedIn, but with no contact info. Then Pike thought of something obvious. That school. What was it again? Oak Grove and Blackfoot? There wasn't a school website, but there was a district one. There was a section for parents. And a subheading was, Contact your child's teacher. Hmm. This would be a pretty forward move, wouldn't it? Pike wrestled with it. The poor lady needed some stranger asking her questions like a hole in the head. Especially after she just fought off an idiot and is probably just starting to recover. Pike left it alone and went back to the dorm and took a nap. Hayes was in there already, his, he his head under sheets in the lower bunk. Still not feeling good at all today. What a surprise. That night, Friday, there was a bonfire in an outdoor cement theater by the stadium. It was pretty impressive. You had the band and the cheerleaders and the whole team got up there in their street clothes with their home jerseys on over their shirts and the head coach made a speech. The coach kept raising his fist for emphasis and each time the whole place, overflowing with students inside and outside the theater too, where they were watching on a giant screen, would erupt in a chant. Afterward, Pike hooked up with a couple of the other recruits, not Hayes this time, and they scoured around Fraternity Row, seeing if there were any parties going on that they could walk into. They got turned away a couple places, but they were enjoying themselves. It was becoming a challenge. Finally, around the corner from the main row, there was a house that didn't look as good or as popular, and they could hear music thumping away in there, and there were a few guys on the front lawn playing beer pong, though Pike suspected no one was drinking. Anyhow, this fraternity gave you the impression it was hurting, like a wannabe party, and one of the recruits talked to the beer pong guys, and they said, come on in. Pike lagged behind for a minute, though, and under the street lamp outside this place, he emailed Danny Andreessen. He had to, he decided. He just did. He tried not to think about it overnight, but when he got up and checked his phone and there was nothing, he was discouraged. Oh, well, he gave it a shot. But he kept checking messages all morning and still zip. Then it occurred to him that that was a school staff email he found and she probably wouldn't even see it until Monday morning. He thought of a back doorway, which was get hold of that newspaper reporter and ask him how to contact the woman. But that was insane. That would never work and would only make the reporter suspicious. They got them to the stadium early and they let the recruits stay on the field through the warm up and right until the opening kickoff. Then they sat low down in the corner of the end zone. Pike tried to visualize himself out there for real, in uniform, and he wasn't sure. Utah State was taken on Wyoming, who had upped its game the last couple seasons and was tied with Boise State for first in the Mountain West Conference. The stadium was packed and the fans were frequently going wild, but Pike got a little bored after the first quarter. He couldn't care less who won. That was the first thing. Second, every play kind of looked the same. Both teams playing fast. No huddles anymore. Everyone just getting to the line right away and then stalling, lifting their heads back up like a bunch of elephants in the circus and looking to the sidelines where one of the coaches was signaling them what to do. With about four minutes left in the first half, Pike's phone buzzed. It was an area code he didn't recognize. He answered it, but couldn't hear anything on the other end because the stadium 
was too damn noisy. He told the person very loudly to please hang on, and he hustled up about 20 rows to where you exited under the stands where all the food concessions were. Even there, he still couldn't hear, so he walked out the main gate, hoping they'd let him back in, and tried it again. Hello? He said. Anyone still there? There was a delay, and Pike was about to hang up when a voice said, I'm still here. It wasn't clear if you were, though. It was a woman, and there was a playful sing-song tone to her voice. Pike wasn't moving a muscle now. Are you... Danny, by any chance, he said. I am indeed, she said. What did you need to speak to me about? Pike stumbled around. Okay, well, I'm not a parent or anything. Yes, I assumed as much. You sound a bit young. He took a deep breath. What I'm going to do here, I'm going to let it all hang out. And if I'm out of line, or especially if I'm completely off target, which I easily could be. Then just hang up on me. Goodness gracious, she said. What? You know where I'm going with this? I have no clue, but I'm somewhat intrigued now, I must admit. I don't believe you sound like a dangerous person or a disturbed one. Are you? The tone a little less playful now. No, no, not at all. You have to take my word for it. All right. Here's the thing. I read about what went down, and I'm going to ask you direct. Did something happen where you all of a sudden got strong? <clears throat> Danny was stunned by the question, but was also cautious. This could be a normal question that someone who'd been following the news might actually have. Are you referring to the incident, she said? No, Pike said, before that. Was it like you woke up one day and you noticed this weird, scary strength? There was maybe 30 seconds of silence on the end of the line, and then Danny clicked off. Pike rolled it around. Maybe he'd actually hit on something and it touched a nerve with her. More likely, though, she took it as some cranker, looking in a roundabout way for gory details of her wasting the guy. Pike didn't doubt she'd dealt with a few of the, those already. Luckily, they let him back in the stadium, his recruit ID tag around his neck, helping out. It was halftime when he sat back down. The marching bands took turns zigzagging across the field, and then someone galloped around on a horse carrying a big flag, and then they had fans come out and try to kick field goals from various distances. Watching that part was hard to take. Midway through the third quarter, his phone buzzed again, and he took a look, and it was Audrey, and he let it go. Though he had to wonder now if her texting him out there might mean something. Jack Hanamaker supposedly got out of the hospital yesterday, after having his jaw wired and a couple other things done that Pike didn't feel particularly guilty about. Still, hard to know how strong the bond may be between Audrey and that guy. Pike guessed he'd find out soon enough. Utah State hung tough, but Wyoming had a few too many weapons, and they busted open a close game in the fourth quarter. Jake Olson had the recruits wait outside the locker room after the game. It took forever, standing there with the parents and girlfriends of the players, waiting for some sign of life. Finally, one by one, the players started coming out, and no one real upset about the final score, more like they were relieved they got through the game without getting hurt. The plan was to get on one of the team buses and they'd go to a restaurant for dinner, a certain steakhouse that was apparently a tradition after every home game, win or lose. It looked like half the players had come out of the locker room, and some were getting on the buses, and some were mingling with their parents or whatever, when Danny called again. This time, to hear her better, he went back into the stadium, since it was empty now, except for a couple guys down on the field, doing post-game turf maintenance on golf carts. 
There was a dead seriousness to her voice that wasn't there before. She said, I just have one question for you. How would you know what may or may not have happened to me? Pike can answer this one one of a few ways, without committing himself to anything. It felt for a couple seconds like a bunch of opposing forces were clashing in his head. He wasn't sure what he was about to blurt out, but then it came. Because it happened to me. Danny hung up again, but this time Pike was pretty darn sure she was going to call back. He took a seat in the stadium. Things started to get dark now, and the lights came on so the maintenance workers could see what they were doing. It took her 20 minutes. You say that, she said, but what exactly happened to you, if you don't mind? Pike said, Okay, I got, like, super strong. It happened. I'll tell you exactly when it happened, because it's not something you forget easy. It was early last month, September 9th, a Friday. She said, Well, did did you have... Was there any warning? Nope. What it was, I tackled a guy in a football game. I'm in high school, out in California. I pretty much knew right then. Next day, I did some shit that confirmed it without a doubt. I'm sorry about my language. It sounded through the phone like Danny was breathing kind of hard, or maybe crying or getting emotional some other way. It seemed like a good idea to keep talking. So we said... I've been trying to figure it out ever since. Barely a minute goes by, I'm not wondering about it. I sort of told one person, this older guy I trust who's trying to help. I try to put on a good face. The thing of it is, I'm scared. I'm scared too, Danny said. They both let that linger. Pike couldn't help wondering what it might be like to meet this person. On the one hand, it could be a massive relief to finally have found someone who gets it. On the other hand, he could obviously be opening a giant can of worms. He considered all this and then asked her, How far is Pocatello from Logan, Utah? Why do you ask, Danny said. It sounded like she's gotten hold of herself, that she wasn't crying or breathing hard anymore. I think I should come up and see you. He said, I see. She said, do you think that's a good idea? She was probably having the same second thoughts about the can of worms. Yeah, Pike said, I do. Danny hung up again. Five minutes later, when she called back, Pike said, geez, you keep doing that to people in normal life or just me? She laughed slightly, which Pike was glad about. Just you, she said. To answer your question, it's an hour and a half, if you're driving. Are you? Pike said he wasn't, but he was hunting around on his phone, and it looked like the same shuttle bus from the Salt Lake City Airport that brought him to Logan continued on to Pocatello. There was one that left from downtown at 7.12. The other part of it is, he said, I'm involved with a group thing here at the college through the weekend. That's fine, naturally, she said, but he thought he detected disappointment in her voice. Give me a few minutes, he said. He hooked it back under the, he hoofed it back under the stadium and over to the locker room and then outside where the buses had been waiting. They were gone and everything was quiet. He knew the name of the steakhouse and could easily take a taxi or an Uber if they had them out here and head into the restaurant and get lost in the shuffle and probably not get in any trouble. Then again, he tried to think. Was there time to grab his stuff out of the dorm room and make it downtown in time for the 712? He decided there was. He didn't call Danny back until he was on the shuttle bus. All that running around, he was sweating like a dog. But that wasn't important. It's me, he said. You said an hour and a half, but this thing, with stops and the rest of it, they're telling me 918 is when I'll be arriving at, 
It looks like Maverick Exit 69. That ring a bell? Yes, I know where it is, Danny said. She didn't say that she'd meet him there. Pike left it alone. She'd have a couple hours to decide what she wanted to do. Meanwhile, he wondered how his recruiting profile would be affected by going AWOL from the thing on the Saturday night. Though it didn't concern him all that much, actually, and he was able to grab a half hour of sleep once the shuttle bus turned off the curvy road from Logan and got on Interstate 15, which was much straighter and better. Chapter 29 Pike stepped down off the bus and there was a woman over by the far guard rail leaning against her car. She had on shorts and a sweater and was wearing a baseball cap. There were a couple of other people being picked up, but they were accounted for now in the parking lot. Pike walked over to the woman, who he was pretty positive was Danny. Are you hungry? She said. That's it? Pike said. How do you even know it's me? I guess I'm just naturally intuitive, she said. Yeah, I'm starving if you really want to know. He was thinking about the steak dinner he missed and hadn't done anything yet to replace. He got in the car with her and they went to Five Guys Burgers. It wasn't bad at all. The best thing were the fries. Pike reminded himself this was Idaho, potato country, and the burger place gave you the name of the actual potato farm they used on a chalkboard next to the counter. Thank you, Pike said, when they got back in the car. I can think straighter now. Danny hadn't said much so far. She mostly listened to Pike and observed, kind of like she was watching him audition, to see if this unlikely, not to mention unworldly scenario, really did add up. But what was happening was they both were dancing around the real subject. No one brought it up. Do you drink coffee, she said. Pike could take it or leave it, but said sure. Danny drove downtown to a 24-hour coffee shop that was right across from the university. She parked on the street. Pike got out and came around the car, and Danny was on the sidewalk. I'll tell you one thing, he said. Forget everything else. This is an adventure. A couple days ago, I fly for the first time, and today I'm in another new state. What do you know? Danny didn't say anything. She just looked at him, not in a hurry to go inside. Pike said, so, I guess I've been rude, all this happening so quick just today. I haven't even really said hello to you. Thanks for meeting me. He reached out his right hand. Danny started to take it to shake hands, but then fell into his arms. She was crying. There was no doubt about that now, like there may have been on the phone. She buried her face in his shoulder and held him tight. I'm sorry, she said. Pike wrapped his arms around her back and he started crying too. He was experiencing a connection that he couldn't expect people to understand. It was... Kind of like meeting a long-lost sister for the first time, except it was more complicated. It just feels so good, Danny said, wiping her eyes and trying to get under control, to be able to let it out. Pike said, you've never let it out before? No, I haven't, she said. You still feel like that coffee? I'd love it, he said. He wished he had better manners and carried a handkerchief or something, like his mom told him to more than once, and then he could help Danny. Her face was wet and her makeup was smearing, so he told her to please use the front of his shirt. And she smiled but didn't, and she pulled something out of her purse. Danny said the strawberry rhubarb pie was good and they were known for it, so Pike ordered a slice. And when he finished it, he decided she was right and got another one. Danny stuck with a cup of coffee. It was a Tuesday night, she said, June 15th, last year, 2015. Holy shit, Pike said, a year and a half then. She said, I just finished my student teaching. I was spending the summer looking hard for a job. I grabbed some hours at the student rec center lifeguarding and teaching swimming. 
Then one night, I took a spin class. Pike was nodding. Where you're going with this, he said. You broke the bike, except you were shocked. You couldn't understand how. Close, he said. Apparently, there are different types of bikes with different ways that they create resistance. Mine had a band that tightened down on a flywheel. It started off innocently. It felt quite good, actually, to be exercising like that. Then, unfortunately, the smoke started. Oh, yeah, I can see that, Pike said. Anyone suspect anything? Fortunately, no, and I didn't suspect anything myself. When class ended and there was no one around, I went back in there, thinking I must have been hallucinating. But the same thing happened. Man, so you reined it in after that, Pike said? Exactly. I've been careful. There have been a few situations where I've had to act quick. I know, Pike said, thinking about the Marcus deal. I give you all the credit. Yes, she said, but I meant other situations. I was in a Barnes & Noble bookstore in the mall, and there was a painter outside with a scaffold, and a little child, and a situation was developing. And you had to intervene, Pike said. Yes, it was strange. I felt an obligation to do so. Not to mention, you had the capability. Yes, that too. Wow, Pike said. Why, Danny said. You've had similar experiences? Oh yeah, a couple of them. The first one, I basically stopped a theft by holding up the front end of a car. Danny didn't seem surprised. But the obligation part, he said. I never thought of it like that. Another one, Danny was saying. I was in line at the motor vehicle's office. An older gentleman, he appears to have a heart attack. He's unconscious and not breathing. Someone starts administering CPR, but I have a strong urge to take over, which I do. I nudge the person out of the way, and then with two fingers, I start massaging the man's heart. I broke his ribs and whatnot, but I could feel his heart responding. By the time EMS arrived, he was sitting up. Pike was digesting this. Among other things, he decided Danny was beautiful, though that was beside the point. I was at the beach three weeks ago, he said. I ran into the water to help a lifeguard. They didn't need me, it turned out, but yeah, it was like someone flicked a switch and I went into action, kind of automatically. What else, she said. Ah, well, there was this road crew fixing an emergency hole, and it was getting dark. I probably just imagined it, but I thought a truck was going to back into one of the guys, so I sort of threw him out of the way. Far? Far enough. Luckily, the other workers got a kick out of it and started ribbing the guy and didn't focus much on me. Danny said, when I first had a problem with Marcus... I tried to hold back. She was talking quieter now, serious. But you heard him anyway, Pike said, lowering his voice now too. I just kind of flicked him away, like you do with a gnat or a mosquito when you're out camping. Her voice broke. Pike wanted to say something, but didn't know what. I'm sorry if I'm making you uncomfortable, she said. Are you kidding, Pike said? This is like the best thing that's happened to me in a month. Plus the guy they roomed me with in Logan. I'm not sure about him. Danny laughed a little. Then she said, What is this? Pike said, Do you have any ideas at all? Like theories? Danny said, I wish I did. Honestly. I'm thankful every day when I wake up and nothing's changed. For the worse, I mean. Beyond that, I simply do not. Pike said, okay, I'll throw something out there in a second. But what about a doctor? You mean, she said, did I get examined by one? At first, when it happened, I nearly marched right in the next day. But then I didn't. I know, Pike said, you start thinking about stuff and it stops you in your tracks. Danny said the negatives could greatly outweigh the positives. Pike said, friends, your family? Nope. Have you? 
A couple people. My girlfriend, Kathy, which I shouldn't have done. She tried, but she couldn't handle it, and then she dumped me. Then, like I mentioned, an old guy who runs a UFO reporting website. That sounds like an unusual person to open up to, Danny said. It was. How about your parents, she said. No way. Okay, here's the thing now. I know this is going to sound totally out of left field. Did you go to a dentist before it happened? Danny had kind of a blank stare. You were right, she said. That is a crazy question. Why? Did you? Well, I'd have to look up the date. But I recall going in early last year, yes. So we're talking 2015, Pike said, like February, March, around then? I think so. And what did they do? Routine checkup. I had one cavity. And they took care of it? What kind of filling? Danny said, my goodness, this is odd. You seem to be on a mission here. Normally I get porcelain, but since you seem to need the gory details, this was a back tooth, so my dentist recommended the old-fashioned type. He said they're stronger. They finished up. It hit Pike that he was pretty drained. Danny insisted on paying for a room for him at the Super 8. She told him she'd stayed there recently and it was nice. Pike slept late, took advantage of the surprisingly complete breakfast spread they put out for you in the lobby, and then reversed the whole shebang. The airport shuttle to Salt Lake, the flight to San Diego, and finally the transfer flight to Fresno. As that final one was coming in for a landing, he reminded himself to not forget to pay her back for the room. Chapter 30 Pike was going through the motions at school the next day. He could have used about another six hours of sleep, but what could you do? He stopped at his locker between third and fourth period, coming down the hall toward him were Audrey and Jack Hanamaker. The guy looked kind of grim and hunched over, but the bad part of it was he had his arm around Audrey and she seemed to be fine with it. Then after seventh period, as he was dumping everything in his locker again, getting ready to go to practice, Kathy taps him on the shoulder. How was your adventure, she said, and for a moment he thought she meant connecting with Danny, and how the heck would she know about that? But, of course, she was asking about the recruiting trip. <clears throat> it was uneven, honestly, he said. It kind of opened my eyes. Maybe not the worst thing to stay right here in California. Anyway, Pike, what I wanted to tell you, Reggie is going to be out here this week. He's willing to speak to you. Geez, Reggie now, first name basis. Could you please? I'm trying to help you. You should take advantage and meet him. Pike knew he was being a jerk. I apologize and I appreciate this. I really do. Kathy told him she'd update him and that Reggie was on a cross-country run and his timing depended on various factors and that was it. And Pike watched her walk toward the end of the hall and disappear out a door. As they were fooling around in the practice field before the whistle blew to start practice, Coach asked Pike how it went. Pike said it went great, but there were a lot of quarterbacks under consideration. Coach told him, you keep your head up and focus, good things happen. This was starting to get old. When he checked his phone that night, there was a message from Mitch. Pike waited until he had some basic homework out of the way. Unfortunately, that was going on. That was still part of the gig, unfortunately, the homework. And finally, he called Mitch back. Now, on the guy holding on to the filling, Mitch said, getting right to it. I believe I've convinced him to get it tested by a lab. Great, Pike said. How'd you pull that off? I'm paying for the sucker, Mitch said, sort of renting it from him, temporarily, so I can control the testing. Dang, so he's like sticking it in an envelope and mailing it to you then? Yeah, I got it worked out. Registered and certified, all that BS, the way they'd ship a diamond. Wow. So then what? Then I'm taking it to a lab out here. Not sure which one yet, but I'm walking it in personally. Okay, let me ask you this. What if the guy just sends you some other filling? 
Don't see it as an issue, honestly, Mitch said. If he did, hypothetically, I'd have to drive out there and kick his ass. Pike liked Mitch's spunk tonight. But how would you know, he said. Okay, let's don't worry about that right now. I'm going by instinct here. This is a simple man whose word is good, as is mine. I'll get it back to him after we figure out what's in it, if anything. Pike was working it around should he tell Mitch about Danny. He didn't see a reason to for now. But before he went to bed, he called her. Too late, he said. Yes, she said. You would have woken me up, but I haven't been able to sleep well for a few weeks. Pike hadn't touched that subject when he met her, but maybe it was okay, he said. Are you still in the same place and all? Yep, the landlord took care of the repairs. I'm okay with that part. It's not the physical environment that's affecting me. Either way, Pike said, why not move into the Super 8? It was great. You can probably make a deal with them for a long-term rate. It's funny you mention that, Danny said. I actually inquired about it. But you're fine for now. Yes, thank you for asking. Was there any particular reason you called? Not really. Because you don't have to have one, she said. This was a special person, Spike, Pike decided. I wish you lived closer, he said. What I'll do, though, any news at all, I'll fill you in. And you're expecting some, Danny said? I'm not. But there are a few irons in the fire. Didn't want to bore you with the details. I still don't. What kind of irons? Okay, it's all sort of embarrassing. Shit, I never would have believed in a million years. Bottom line, there's a guy, supposedly, he got a filling, got strong, panicked, had it taken out. Then he got weak, weaker than before. Danny was quiet. We're trying to test the filling, Pike said. See what was in it? We, Danny said, sorry, me and the old guy in L.A., him taking care of it, actually. I see. What? You sound like something's wrong. No, it's just that I've been wondering about that the past two days now. What if I remove mine? Pike said, I've gone through that too. And common sense told me that would be too simple, Danny said. So this confirms it, I guess, which is a bit disappointing, nonetheless. I know. You say there is one more iron in the fire, she said. Yeah, well, a truck driver that we sort of connected with. He could be way out in the twilight zone, but he claims his brother had it. I'm supposed to meet him this week. Had it? He says the guy was in the military, that he died in Afghanistan a couple years ago. Gosh, Danny said. Pike decided to leave out the part about Reggie saying his brother traveled back in time. Enough was enough for now. And they said goodnight. It was Halloween and kids had been ringing the bell all night. Pike couldn't help thinking, what was the atmosphere like at Audrey's? It had barely been a month. The Milburns had had a private funeral and just a few days after that is when Mr. Milburn got into it with Fox's dad. Holidays, even ones like Halloween, had to be the worst. Pike called Audrey. This is not about Jack or anything, he said. I was out of line trying to move in on things. Thank you for saying that, Audrey said. I've been feeling some guilt. Nah, please don't. But you doing okay tonight? Yes, she said. It's been refreshing, actually. The little children's faces. I know what you're thinking, but tonight was good for me. And Haley both. Pike didn't believe her. Nothing would be good for a long while. Don't be a stranger, he said. You neither, Audrey said.